What's up, and welcome to Clarity for Parents of Athletes, bringing you stories from professional athletes about their parents and how they were raised. My name is Gabe Nocer from aclearmind.com. And welcome to episode number nine. And before I delve into this episode, I wanted to let you know I have a way for you to leave me messages, uh, voicemails through a website called speakpipe.com. It's S P E A K P I P E.com. And if you do speakpipe.com forward slash clarity four, Uh, You can leave me a voicemail no longer than five minutes. Uh, If you want to keep it private between us, if you're having a situation uh, that you want to keep private, I'm happy to listen and respond to you. Just let me know that you want to keep it private. But if it's something that you want to share for a future episode, I'd really appreciate that. Give me some material to work with, uh, something that maybe you're experiencing that other parents have experienced as well. Or if you're a coach listening to this as well on uh, coaches dealing with parents who have athletes, Uh, That's awesome as well. So again, it's speakpipe.com forward slash clarity four. Now, I hope you enjoyed all the episodes before. The last one was with Doug Flutie, college football Heisman Trophy winner from 1984, talking about his family and uh, growing up and his family with his, today's family with his children and wife. Uh, some really, really cool insights uh, with his interview, as with all the other interviews, of course, as well. And we have more interviews with athletes coming up. And But first, this one uh, was just with me. I wouldn't want to say just with me, but it's with me. And I wanted to wish you all a happy belated Father's Day. Um, special shout out to all the dads out there, stepdads, boyfriends, and single moms who have to wear both hats when it comes to raising their children. Um, It's really an amazing experience for me to be a father and to grow both with my experience as being a stepfather, um, which is a little unfair. I call her my daughter. She's uh, been a part of my life for, let me see, 12, almost 13 years. It's kind of crazy. And then, of course, um, as a, a biological father to my son, but both my children have really helped me grow uh, exponentially. And I'm sure you've probably experienced the same same thing on your end uh, as a father or as a mother, of course. Uh, But since it was just Father's Day, I want to focus a little bit more on on the father and uh, masculine traits, which can also be called the yang. Uh, I'm sure you may have heard the term yin and yang. Masculine traits are both present in men and women, and of course, female traits are both present in men and women as well. Uh, the yin, right? That's the yin side. It's the female side, and the more masculine traits are the yang side. So, and what we tend to see in those masculine, typical masculine traits are, you know, competition, intellectualism, movement, action. Uh, courage, extroversion, excitement, kind of being more adventurous. Now, as you can see with sports, those typically go hand in hand with uh, being an athlete, especially a successful athlete. If you have a high competitive spirit, um, then you tend to perform harder, you work harder on, on the playing field or on the court, whatever it is, on the rink. Now, there are, like I mentioned, there are masculine and female traits in each person. And it's not to say you know, only the young traits can lead to a success. Uh, I believe that a complete balance of yin and yang, of masculine and feminine, can lead to that success. So you know, the more yin, typical feminine traits are you know, cooperation, intuition, which you have to use both cooperation, especially in a team sport, uh, or in an individual sport where you're cooperating with yourself, uh, but also with your coach, uh, intuition, which that really is what helps lead 
into getting a flow is when athletes are in the zone more when they are really relying on just their intuition. They're not relying too much on intellectualism. intellectualism. Um, you know, the intellectual side is important because you have to know the game and get to understand the tactical side of the game, the decision-making aspect of the game. But your intuition is where your creative side just comes out in a natural flow. Other feminine traits are stillness as opposed to the movement of the young, being more cautious, which we have to know our limits, right? And even as an athlete, you have to know your limits and that helps make you, helps you make wise decisions while you're playing the game because you can't have just complete courage because then if there's too much yang in your playing decisions, then you're just playing erratically and you can make a lot of mistakes, turn the ball over, um, and, you know, sometimes in tackling, we see players getting a little too overly driven with making their tackles and just really poor decisions. It happens in all sports, but that's when they, the, in soccer, you know, they can get unnecessary red cards, yellow cards, which can cost the team. Uh, other aspects are you know, being more introverted, more calm. So you can probably start to see that that balance of, you know, intellectual versus intuitive and competitive versus cooperation, having that balance and being somewhat centered in the middle is what can help you achieve at a higher rate. You know, if you're too much young energy, you know, that can lead to things like anger, restlessness, frustration, violence sometimes, trouble letting go and relaxing headaches, uh, insomnia, some constant need for stimulation. It's really a harder time for athletes to relax. And I talked to Andrea Neal, if you, if you remember back to the episode, I talked to her a little bit about that, that athletes just drive and drive and drive because that's the way to achieve success, or at least the illusion is. But really, if you have that competitive drive, plus the ability to recharge and relax yourself, that balance is really what helps you flourish as an athlete. And that's where I try and get my clients to get into is that middle part of the yin and the yang. And the yin in the yang, so that kind of balance within competition. So it's any time that I try and achieve, help my clients achieve balance within the masculine traits, like take, for example, that, that competitive spirit, right? The, that's a, a typical masculine trait. But if we add love in there, loving to compete and loving to do everything that it takes to compete, which includes loving to train, loving to learn, loving, you know, the, the actual game, loving your drive with your teammates and connecting with your teammates where everybody is at the same competitive spirit. So the love within everything that we're doing is what helps balance balance things out, right? Too much yang is not good. Too much yin is not good. Yang tends to wear down the body physically. And that's really where I wanted to focus. This episode is on injuries. And we talked about this uh, in the Andrea Neal episode as well, where she was talking about she almost lost her leg and uh, she got into a really bad motorcycle accident. If you didn't listen to that episode, I highly encourage you to go back. I believe it's in part one of the episode where she's talking about her injuries. She basically almost, you know, she was a high level Olympic hopeful badminton player, decided to, she was torn between badminton and soccer, decided to take a hiatus and... Uh, worked on a ship. She went off the ship, had a little break and got on a motorcycle with a friend of hers from the, that she was working with, got into an accident, really tore up her, her leg or her knee and was close to losing it. And so I'd mentioned it a little bit in the episode, the, the work of Louise Hay. Now she was this kind of guru, spiritual guru who connected the physical ailments and injuries and sicknesses with emotional thought patterns. I don't know exactly how she did that, uh, but everything that I've experienced for myself in her work, um, I use a book from her called uh, 
Heal Your Body A to Z. So it's Heal Your Body A to Z by Louise Hay. H-A-Y is the last name. So everything I've experienced for myself personally, and when I look it up in the book, I'm like, oh my God, that's you know exactly what I've been feeling and thinking and fearing with myself. So I'll take you to, or I'll, I'll do an example or give you an example of something that I went through maybe about a year ago, maybe a little bit more than a year ago. But basically it was a, a Monday and Tuesday, this happened back to back days, that I had very intense and explosive arguments with two different people that I really, really love and, and care about deeply. So, you know, the first one happened on Monday, the second one happened Tuesday. And in the middle of this, or I guess now that I think about it, towards the end of the second argument, I just like was keeling over in pain in my back, kind of my upper back area on the left hand side. And just, it was like out of nowhere. And it was right when this conversation was coming to an end. So, you know, again, this, the, the, the preface is that I was having conversations with two people that I really, really love deeply. And so the second one, after the second one in pain, could barely walk. I uh, made it to work and I was just like in such pain. Luckily, I had a call with my coach and I ended up looking up before the call with my coach. I looked up, okay, what does upper back mean? And that means lack of emotional support, feeling unloved and holding back love. So I could see in that moment where these two people that I loved were arguing with me. I felt attacked. I was really defensive and I was feeling unloved in that moment. And that was a conscious feeling. I wasn't thinking to myself, oh my God, these people are arguing with me and I love them and now I'm feeling unloved. No, it was a completely unconscious thought that I was having. I don't know what was going on. The thought that I was having was I was angry with these people and I was feeling attacked and I was getting super defensive. So luckily my coach um, kind of talked me through it and if you remember back to the first episode, I talk a lot about the inside out reality that everything, every bit of happiness, every bit of love, everything comes from within us. So when I was feeling attacked by these two people, and like I said, one on Monday and one on Tuesday, I unconsciously was feeling unloved because they were attacking me. They weren't loving me the way that I needed. So my coach talked me through that and said, look, there's, this is another point where you were kind of focusing on the outside in. You were relying on these people to give you love. Now, you can still argue with people knowing that inside, that's where your love really flourishes and comes from. It doesn't come from needing to love other people or needing other people to love you. That's more like it. Needing other people to love you. If you rely on that, then that's called the outside in illusion, right? Because you can't get love from other people. Now, you can love other people in relationships, whether they're platonic or romantic. You're always only responsible for your part in the relationship. So what I was doing in this argument with these two people is that I was relying on them to give me love. And boom, it led instantaneously to a pain in my upper back. And again, that pain in the upper back comes from feeling of a lack of emotional support, feeling unloved, and holding back love. So I was probably doing that as well. I was holding back love in that moment because I was angry. Now, you can have arguments. I could have had the same argument with those people coming from more of a place of love and not such ego and frustration. Right? I could have validated how they were feeling and expressed how I was feeling, but I just erupted. And they erupted back, and it was just a back-and-forth volcanic activity of emotions. And that led me susceptible to this injury. So, you know, it's not to say that I worked with my coach and, boom, my back felt better. Because the body and the emotional side work hand-in-hand hand together. So what I did is, I, you know, I worked through it with my coach. I started to see, okay, yeah, the inside-out inside nature that I needed to be following, you know, where I was following the outside in illusion of it. But then I also got a 
massage, I visited my chiropractor because the body doesn't just heal only if you're only healing the emotional side, right? You need to heal the physical side as well. Now, a lot of people and what we're focused on, especially in the Western societies, we just focus on the physical side of things, right? So we're just, a lot of us are just focused on, okay, you get a cut, you heal it, right? Well, that's an easy one, but whatever, some kind of uh, illness, let's say. You get an illness and you focus on healing the illness. There's rarely any focus on the emotional side of things. And that's what I like to do with my clients and with even with my friends. I talk about, you know, whenever they're having some kind of physical pain, I talk to them about it, All right? So I wanted to, uh, my back did start feeling better, by the way. And, and that was kind of an area, actually, for years, that part of my body was hurting. And it just showed to me that I was focused on, trying to feel that I was the only time I was feeling loved is if somebody was loving me. When I started to focus on the fact that the love always comes from inside of me, then really I was always feeling this sense of love. And then when I had, you know, loving encounters with my friends and with my wife and my family, then it just kind of enhanced the feeling of love compared to what I was experiencing in the past when I was focused more on the outside-in illusion, right? I hope that makes sense. It kind of raised the bar of the feeling of love. I was always at a high level of feeling love when I was by myself or conversing with myself, but then it kind of, when you I was in some kind of loving connection, either platonic or romantic, that was enhanced. When I started focusing more from building that love from the inside of me. So I wanted to go over the list of different things in the book. And I'd like for you to do your best and listen with an open mind about this. So these are different conditions and the emotional thought patterns that go along with it. So again, this is from Heal Your Body A to Z by Louise Hay. And I want you to think about both yourself and your children, because your children have injuries, they have ailments and sicknesses as well. Children, in my opinion, are they're a little bit different. It's not necessarily what they're going through strictly. Children act as a filter of emotions that they're experiencing in the house, especially, right? So if you have an outburst of anger, they're feeling that anger. They're a lot more sensitive to it, and that can affect their sickness and their health and their illnesses and their injuries. So think about these things, both with your experiences. Maybe you, you experience these emotional side of these physical illnesses and injuries. And then also think about your child. What have they gone through physically? So I'm going to go, these are all in alphabetical order. It's not the whole book it's just different ones that are somewhat sports related and also just child-related or adult-related outside of sports. So here's the first one, acne, not accepting the self, dislike of the self. Does that ring a bell, especially maybe in your teenage years? And then, of course, there's going to be people that say, well, yeah, teenagers are going through a lot of hormonal changes. I agree, but not all teenagers experience acne the way that some others do. So there tends to be both a physical component and an emotional component that can create a perfect storm. Some are going to be more susceptible than others, you know. So acne, not accepting the self, dislike of the self. Addiction, running from the self. Fear, not knowing how to love the self. So it's no no wonder you don't know how to love the self, then you run to alcohol, drugs, right? Running away from who you truly are, from the pain of the thinking. Right? That's what creates our suffering is our thoughts. All right, ankle, inflexibility and guilt, not receiving pleasure. Now I'm going to tell a quick story. I'm not going to tell a story about every single one, but uh, just as they come up, I'm going to tell it. So there is a, I don't want to use his name or her name, I should say, his or her name. There is a soccer player. Okay, it's a him um, who was recently uh, accused of sexual assault and... Of course, the player denied it, and 
within a week had a major ankle injury before a competition. And as soon as I saw that, I was like, I know, I know what ankle is. So I didn't even have to look it up, but I'm like, that's guilt right there. So it's no surprise that accused of sexual assault, boom, injury. And I saw the injury on, uh, they, you know, they were showing, it was during a training session. So I saw the video of the training session and it looked like nothing basically, you know, but this player left himself susceptible to injury because he was going through a lot of guilt. So again, I'm not saying he's guilty, but I'm just saying it's, you know, maybe a sign that there's something more behind the injury there. Anxiety, not trusting the flow and process of life. Arms represent the capacity and ability to hold the experiences of life. Athlete's foot, frustration at not being accepted. Inability to move forward with ease. You know, I went through that as a, a child. I had, I had athlete's foot. And now I play sports more than I did back then. But now I don't have athlete's foot. So it's interesting because I was definitely going through that frustration of not feeling accepted. Uh, again, at an unconscious level. Back. So here's a big one for you. And I hear this a lot from adults. And I, I ask them whenever somebody says, oh, yeah, my back hurts. I just ask, oh, where is it hurting? And they say lower back, lower back. I know because I've been through it as well. It's a fear of money, a lack, fear of a lack of financial support. So does that sound familiar to anybody? Uh, Middle back, guilt, upper back. Like we talked about earlier, lack of emotional support, feeling unloved, holding back love, bleeding gums, lack of joy in the decision made in life, bone break, rebelling against authority. Again, just go through these, be open. If they don't mean anything, just move on, but they might mean something to you. So think deeply about what you're experiencing at a time in your life. Breast problems, cysts, lumps, soreness, a refusal to nourish the self, putting everyone else first. For you women and moms out there, does that sound familiar? Do you happen to <laughs> feel like you put everyone else first as a mom. I'm sure you do. I know my wife definitely uh, went through that. Uh, cancer, deep hurt, long-standing resentment. Cramps, tension, fear, gripping, holding on. So, you know, players, a lot of athletes go through cramps. Dizziness, flighty, scattered thinking, a refusal to look. Elbow represents changing directions and accepting new experiences. I had a really good friend who went through that, had this elbow injury at a time when he was thinking about changing jobs, which he did. And it was from, it was on the right side of his body. So that competitive, that driving side. So it was really interesting. He was going through that at that time. Feet un- represent our understanding of ourselves, of life, and of others. Fingers. All right, so the thumb represents intellect and worry. Index represents ego and fear, which is interesting because when you point, you're pointing at somebody, you're, it's almost like you're blaming somebody else for something. That's what the ego does best. It loves to blame. Middle finger represents anger and sexuality. Which that's why I guess that's maybe where the the flipping somebody off came from, right? From that anger. Um, The ring finger represents union and grief. Foot problems, fear of the future and of not stepping forward in life. Headaches, invalidating the self, self self-criticism. Hernia, ruptured relationships. Hip problems, fear of going forward in major decisions, nothing to move forward to. Injuries in general, anger at the self, feeling guilty. Insomnia, fear, not trusting the process of life, guilt. Joints, they represent changes in the direction of life and the ease of these movements. Knee problems, stubborn ego and pride, inability to bend. Fear and flexibility won't give in. So it's no wonder there's a lot of knee issues in sports, right? Because 
when we tiptoe past that line, that fine point of doing something out of love or driving from ego, that's what leads our body susceptible to injuries and also can lead to a point of where it's more difficult to, to rehabilitate, right? Can be longer and more arduous process. Left side of the body, which is, uh, it represents the feminine side. So it represents receptivity, taking in feminine energy, that yin side. Leg problems, lower, lower leg, fear of the future, not wanting to move. Now, I'll take a little break from the list and, and tell a, you know, a little story to kind of back that up. There was a basketball player who was playing in the NBA Finals recently, and you know, he had a calf injury originally. And I said in my head, I, you know, I knew what lower leg meant. I knew it was fear of the future of something. And so, you know, I just put that in my head. I said, oh, wow, I wonder what he's going through. And then the player came back after a month, hadn't really practiced too much, but apparently doctors cleared him, played and was playing really well and then ruptured his Achilles. And I said, wow, this must be really serious what he's, what's, what he's going through. You know? So I just kind of Googled uh, to see if there are any articles out there. And sure enough, this player was going through a, a free agency or was about to. His contract was going to expire and he had the choice of either to take an option for another year or move to another team. So it said to me, I was like, oh, yeah, it's no wondering. No wonder that he was going through that because I'm sure without knowing him, without talking to him, I'm sure that he's hesitating or, or kind of unsure about what to do and the ramifications that's going to have for himself and maybe his family. I, I don't know. I'm just guessing on that point. And then, of course, which leg was it? It was the right right leg. So, again, that driven competitive side, right, built in with the fear of the future, boom, left himself open to susceptibility, as well as, you know, the physical side of playing so many basketball games for so many years, you know, you add the physical susceptibility and the emotional susceptibility, and it creates this perfect storm for injuries. So best wishes to that, that person. If you're a basketball fan, I'm sure you can figure out who it was. All right. Neck problems, refusing to see other sides of a question, stubbornness, inflexibility, have you ever woken up with a crick in your neck, you know, when you feel like you've slept the same way before and you had no problems? Well, maybe you had some kind of emotional thinking going on related to, you know, a little bit of stubbornness on your end. And then all of a sudden, boom, neck problems. Uh, nosebleeds, a need for recognition, feeling unrecognized and unnoticed. Right side of the body. So we talk about you know, that's the masculine side of things, giving out, letting go. Shin, breaking down ideals. Shins represent the standards of life. Shoulders represents our ability to carry out experiences in life joyously. We make, a life, we make life a burden by our attitude. Sinus problems, irritation with one person, someone close. Slipped disc. Again, this is relates to the back. Feeling totally unsupported by life. Indecisive. Sore throat. Holding in angry words. Feeling unable to express the self. Spasms. Tightening our thoughts through fear. Sprains. Anger and resistance. Not wanting to move in a certain direction in life. Toes. Represents the minor details of the future. Wrists represent movement and ease. So what do you think? Did any of those kind of resonate with you about any injuries that you've had? I know it has with me. It has with many of my clients that I've worked uh, through with issues. Uh, and I, I really love it. Obviously, athletes leave themselves more susceptible to injuries. So there's, it's, they're more sensitive, in my opinion, for injuries to come out because they put their bodies through so much. So they really have to develop a balance emotionally with what they're experiencing in life and work through that process, you know? 
Because obviously injuries are going to happen in sports. And I, I know there's one big question to say, well, you know, if you break your leg, you break your leg. And I'm like, yeah, of, of course, you know, there's going to be injuries that happen. But these unresolved th- thought patterns, they lead to the susceptibility of injuries and they can lead to a longer recovery time. The, the body and the mind work together. And injuries can happen without unresolved contaminated thinking, but the seriousness and the recovery time can be affected. So as I mentioned before, children are filters in our homes. They unconsciously process our stuff. I remember there was a time in when I was in high school, I was about to head into tryouts, soccer tryouts, and I was, I think I was moving like a computer around, um, which I'd done a million times before, but all of a sudden my lower back just like was, went through a lot of pain. And as I mentioned, if you remember from this list that I just read, that had a, an issue with financial concerns, right? Not feeling supported financially. Now, of course, I was in high school. I wasn't concerned at all about money, but I remember my mom experiencing, you know, some stress financially. She, you know, my parents uh, were living in different countries. So I was living with my mom in the U.S. So she was raising me day to day on her own. You know, my dad was there emotionally, financially in a different way, but my mom on the day-to-day stuff uh, was going through stuff financially and, and a little bit of concern. So I think that passed on to me. That's my hypothesis of that went on. You know, again, I wasn't worried about money at the time. I was like 15 years old, you know, not very many 15 year olds are concerned about money. Some are, um, but I really feel like I was being a filter of something that was going on in the house. You know, so this takes me to the point that your child, they're going to get pressure from coaches and from their peers. That's one of the big things that that uh, Ashley McIver Demerit talked about. She said the last place they need pressure from is from their parents in the home, right? That's got to be a child's safe place. The more unconditional love that they feel, the more validation and patience speaking from the heart and not from a place of ego or anger or frustration, the more their body will support them. And the stronger they are emotionally, the more they can handle things physically, but also they can handle everything they're going to go through on the outside of the house. They can handle that better the stronger they are emotionally. There's always going to be something. And sometimes as parents, we get... And this idea of wanting to protect our children from any kind of emotional um, stress or strain, of course, physical stress and strain, we really want to protect them from that. You know, but what we can do, we can make them stronger emotionally simply by providing that unconditional love. And again, I say this over and over again, this does not mean let them do whatever they want. That's not unconditional love because part of love is discipline and learning boundaries and learning what is okay and what is not okay uh, based on what your family values are, right? So this comes for you as well. Now, you are the one who's most in charge of supporting yourself emotionally. Children are still developing that, right? But for adults, we are always responsible for our part of our emotion. It may seem that other people make us frustrated or angry or other situations do, but it's really how we're viewing those situations and those people that cause our emotional reactions. All, right, all of our emotional reactions come from thought. Every emotion you have comes from a thought. You cannot have an emotion without a thought. Right, And all of our contaminated thinking comes from a place of feeling like, having a lack of control, approval, or security. I said this in a couple episodes ago. I believe it was episode five, right? Was it episode five? Yes, it was episode five. How to help your children listen to you. Now, I really delved deeply into talking about those three aspects. Every negative thought or every contaminated thought, I like to call them, comes from a place of feeling like you have a lack of control, approval, or security. So the first thing to do is to become conscious or aware of the fact that you're thinking. 
Now, the more we can do this, the easier it becomes to recognize that we're just having a thought and that it's not real. But consciousness is not just awareness. What it also does, it's an increase in the vibration of your thoughts. So the more you can raise your consciousness and your vibration to a higher level, then the less fear you come up with. And that fear is, again, it's that's the basis of all those negative thoughts. That is what feeds the ego. That fear of having a lack of control, approval, uh, or acceptance, uh, or security. So the more we can raise our consciousness and vibration to a higher level with less fear, the easier it is to become aware of when our thoughts are recirculating with the contamination. The more negative or contaminated thinking that we experience, the more susceptible we are to injuries and illnesses. Again, sometimes it takes some kind of physical trigger to make it explode, right? That's like igniting the dynamite switch to let the injuries happen, some kind of physical trigger. As I mentioned in my my uh, story about my back and about my experience of the the explosive conversations I had with those two people in my life, right? I didn't even have a physical, <laughs> right, ignition. It just, boom, all of a sudden, it just, I just crippled over. But again, it took me to heal my body and heal the emotional side. And within, you know, a little bit of time, I could go from barely walking to back to playing soccer again. So, you know, this is a start for you to start to see kind of the impact that emotional thought patterns has on the physical side of things. And the best prevention to injuries is obviously to have a clear, as much of a clear mind as possible, which really means to be aware of the fact when contaminated thinking starts to cloud our minds, that we can become aware and conscious of the fact that we're thinking and to put our trust into our process, be okay with where we are, and trust that the universe has our back, then everything happens for a reason. And that we also have the power to create the life that we want through manifestation. That's a whole other episode we can get into at some other point. So, of course, it's easier to say, oh, yeah, just trust the universe. You know, there's a lot to work through. You know, it's not, it's, it can be easy. It sounds easy, but it definitely takes work. And as anything, you know, having a good therapist by your side, having a good coach by your side, whether it's me or somebody else, that other person or a group of people, if you're doing some type of group therapy, can really help you make as much of your unconscious conscious. And that's how we heal. We bring unconscious beliefs and thought patterns up to the conscious level, which can take some work emotionally, and some people aren't comfortable with that. But if you can push past that level of comfort and know that's the best way to heal yourself and to flourish emotionally in life and to be happy, which is the number one thing I want my children to be, you know, and I want myself to be is happy. So the more that we understand that that is the way to happiness, that is the way to really flourish from the inside out. If we can push past through that, then we can release it. So it's about bringing the unconscious to the conscious level and then understanding that we can release the shackles of our unconscious beliefs about ourselves that hold us back from achieving everything that we want in life. But if it's just buried in the unconscious, it is really hard to do. So I highly encourage you, if you're ready to go for it, find a good therapist, find a good coach. I'm always available either to point you in the right direction or to research if it you know, I find the right person for you. But if we just remain in this safety of living in our unconscious, then it's going to affect us, not just for ourselves, but as anything, it trickles down to our children. They will feed off you. They will feed off your energy and they will adapt the way that you talk to yourself, the way that you talk to others. And the more that they talk to themselves in a way 
that has a lot of negative thinking. I'm sure you can see through all this injury connection, you can see it's going to leave them susceptible, not just emotionally, but it can lead them susceptible physically as well. I hope you enjoy this. As always, you can connect with me through my website at clearmind.com and also through speakpipe.com forward slash clarity four. So S P E A K pipe P I P E dot com forward slash clarity four. And you can leave me a voicemail and I can return it. Or if you want to leave a message that I can potentially use on a future podcast episode, just let me know uh, that as well. I'm happy to do that. You can also get a hold of me through my social media links on my website, aclearmind.com. Thanks for listening. Much love to you and many blessings. Mm-hmm.